Hey, I'm Sachin. And I'm Adam. We interview the best leaders from around the world and unpack their failures, successes, and ideas they're passionate about. We do this because we think the best learnings in life don't come from a textbook. Rather, they come from open and personal conversations. Thanks for joining in and enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the Sachin and Adam show. Today we've got a really great guest who's called Moses Lowe. He's a fintech entrepreneur, someone who grew up in Australia and then went to Y Combinator um, in the States and has been running his own fintech company for five years. We first heard of Moses through listening to his podcast um, on The Quest, which is Justin Kahn's podcast. And we we're both really blown away about how he scaled his business. Um, a lot of learnings from going through Y Combinator as well. So we're really excited to talk to Moses today. Sachin, you yeah. can introduce him a bit further. And, and I think blown away is an understatement because I remember I was cooking, doing my meal prep for the week when I was listening to that podcast. And I sent Adam probably like 30 or 40 messages being like, we need to talk to this guy. Like he's done some things very similar to what we want to do. Um, so in that, Moses started um, off at UNSW. Um, he graduated with a high distinction. And then he started off his career at BCG as a management consultant, as you do, um, as we do. And he's then founded a few businesses, but the most notable was Zendit, which actually was the first Indonesian business to go through Y Combinator. And for those of you who don't, don't know what Y Combinator is, it's probably the most prestigious accelerator in the world. Yeah. And you get mentored by some of the biggest names in startups, which is really exciting. And recently, Zendit just raised a massive round. Uh, this is public in information. Um, and so it's crazy to see someone from Australia who's gone overseas and is killing it on the big stage. Um, so Moses, we like to start off our podcast by asking our guests for a story or an anecdote that kind of shows who they are as a person. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, the story that immediately comes to mind um, is, I call it the cockroach story, but uh, it's uh, living in Indonesia, um, you're surrounded by cockroaches. And uh, there's, there's one moment that I think captured my mind really well. Um, we worked out of a small house and we had maybe 15 people working from this house. And I remember my, uh, my desk was outside the toilet because I think you, leaders should be servants. So I had the worst seat in the house. <laughs> and uh, I just remember sitting there and one time this door opened and one of my colleagues let out, he's a big dude, but he let out like a very loud squeal and uh, like jumped out of the room. Um, and uh, when I asked him why he like freaked out and ran away, but there was a cockroach flying around in the bathroom and most of us have seen cockroaches, but seeing a cockroach fly is one of the most scary things, uh, in life for a lot of folks. Um, but I think I really embraced that, that story in that time, because, uh, one of our really important mentors in, in my life, Justin Khan, who made Twitch, which sold to Amazon for a billion bucks he had given me the advice to be a cockroach, survive and do whatever it takes to survive. Um, and eventually if you survive, you, you might make it. Um, and so we, we've really taken that animal to heart in terms of how we operate. And I, I love the cockroach because um, it's you know, rumored to survive nuclear disasters. Uh, it will freak out objects much and animals much bigger than itself. Um, it will make a mess of, of everything, um, but it's actually a quite functional little creature. So. Uh, we really appreciate what it stands for. And uh, we talk about internally the cockroach mentality. <laughs> I never thought it'd be a compliment to be a cockroach, but <laughs> here you go. Uh, now, Moses, you've done some really incredible things in your life, obviously going through Y Combinator and starting Send It. And I want to know how someone born in Canberra went from living there, growing up in Australia to really the heights of the startup world. So could you paint a bit of a picture of how your life sort of went from the beginning to Y Combinator? Yeah, it's, it starts before my time. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. His first job was collecting sticks from a hill and selling it at the market, no education. Uh, and then he sent nine kids to universities overseas. This is in Malaysia. Um, my father went to, to uni in Australia. Um, I grew up in a few different places, Malaysia, Australia, um, and, and Canberra. But one of the most fortunate things I think started when I was 13 and my teacher made us play these weird games. One of the games was, was a life game and we were put into, um, we had jobs that we got based on a maths test that we took. So me and my friend were the doctors in the village. We then 
realized we were a monopoly, so we charged really high prices uh, because every X period in this game, you had to go see the doctor. Then we were making tons of money from being a monopoly. So we then bought our friend's electronics business. And there's only two of every kind of business in this village. And so we then dropped all the prices in the electronics store and made our other friend bankrupt because <laughs> we could were making money from being doctors. And now we had two monopolies. Um, and so it was that parent teacher interview where my teacher told my parents, he's a grade six, said, maybe he wants to do business. And so I've had my mindset of entrepreneurship ever since. I think I was lucky to, to understand my calling early on. Um, then I discovered the capital reserve system, which I thought was the coolest thing that banks are private institutions allowed to print money. Uh, I thought that was really fascinating. So I said to myself, well, I want to own a bank one day. So I did uh, finance and information systems at uni because that's the closest thing I could find. I knew tech would be the answer. Uh, I just didn't know how. And in Australia, there's not a ton of fintech, at least. And in the early 2000s, when I was going through, I was lucky that the kind of at UNSW, the same you know, scholarship program that I went through, the Atlassian guys were a few years ahead. So the first time I heard of a startup was Atlassian before it was Atlassian. It was, it was just a couple of guys writing code and selling software instead of in boxes, uh, which is at the time was normal. They wanted to do this as a subscription as a service thing, which was unheard of. So I was very lucky to kind of be riding their coattails. Um, and then, you know, in Australia, there's not great places to do startups. I needed to learn how to run businesses and I needed to kind of get over myself, the kind of Southeast Asian inability to speak to authority or, or uh, be able to have confidence to speak to, to people uh, much older than myself. So BCG was a great kind of way to learn to think. Uh, so went into consulting, uh, but very clear I needed to get to the Valley because that's where big ideas are done. That's where big money is raised. Uh, Australia is too small a place and some cultural things I think make it hard to do startups in Australia. Um, but I decided to come to the States and learn. Learned what I needed to learn. Then I wanted to go back to markets that no one else cares about. I'm all about this kind of playing the game rather than um, uh, yeah, being careful about learning the rules of the game and then learning to play the game, but not as other people do. So, you know, in most startup world, people that come to the Valley don't want to leave. But in my sense, it was, hey, big fish, small pond. If I go back to Southeast Asia, you have the fastest growing markets on earth where most people can't compete unless you're from the region. And so uh, we, we were from the region. I, I look like this. I speak enough to speak to get Silicon Valley investors. And so there's this really unique place to play. And so I wanted to be back in Southeast Asia. So that's why we started. So that's the short version. <laughs> And Moses, before we dive into that kind of comparison between Australia and Silicon Valley and its different mindsets, I'd love to ask what you, I'd love to bring it back a little bit. You said you wanted to start a bank. Now, what do you think that motivation was to start a bank and to, you know, create businesses in the world? The motivation to start a bank, at least when I was a teenager, was really selfish. It was just the ability to print money as a private institution. <laughs> I just found money, money, just such an interesting concept because we all agree that this thing exists. Uh, we sign value to a piece of paper or, or plastic if, you're, if we're in Australia. Um, but it's really, we all have the common belief that it exists, otherwise it has no value. Um, and there's been plenty of times in history where that belief no longer exists and then money gets inflated away. So I just found the concept of money so interesting. And then typically it's the, it's the commission of central banks to print money. But then if you're a private bank, you have this magical ability to kind of come up with more money, whether it's through leverage and trading or other things, which isn't quite a perfect analogy, but at least when I was a teenager, it was just this fascination that these, these private individuals had so much ability to print things, whereas most people work per hour. So it's like the highest leverage things you can do in the world is, uh, you know, time is, is very constrained, but if you can print money or you can use leverage, you have this ability to kind of create unlimited resources. So that to me, that fascinated me about money and how the world works. And, and I've also read that you can comfortably live on $23,000 a year. So it seems like there's some conflicting ideas there. Well, it was, it was, uh, it was advice by one of my other mentors who said, um, keep, now this is Justin Kahn as well, keep your personal burn low because then you have a lot more options in life. So growing up in, a, I didn't always grow up with this life. Uh, when we were in Malaysia, we were on much thinner budgets. And so I think, having those kinds of parents taught you to live on less. Um, and actually you can be really happy in life on, on like 23 grand a year, which is what we spent uh, in the first couple of years of doing Send It. So we lived, I lived with my co-founders with my wife 
she's a very gracious person to do that she'll never do it again but uh <laughs> to be able to kind of save the costs and eat ramen and do everything you got to do when you start a startup very frugal life it's good for the entrepreneurs so something you said before moses was that you entered consulting because you wanted to learn how to think could you just unpack this sort of process of your decision making at the time so you just left university and you went straight into bcg what were the sort of factors that contributed to you really wanting to go into consulting um and potentially why didn't you want to go into entrepreneurship straight away or other industries what was it about management consulting yeah i think one part of the, the framework was was this like the choices for me was entrepreneurship um banking or consulting entrepreneurship i wanted to do but i realized that uh the largest scale entrepreneurs start uh, are from the valley on average there's big entrepreneurs from everywhere but in terms of like greatest creation of wealth in human history uh in the last like 50 years china might be changing that now but at least um for those of us in the western world then valley was where it was to be so i wanted to get there um but i didn't think i had the skills at the time i wasn't computer science i i didn't have an idea that i was really passionate about um so entrepreneurship i i and probably i was also scared if i'm honest uh so i didn't think entrepreneurship was right between banking and consulting uh my sister is a banker so i got to be careful what i say but i i just thought consulting was a better way to understand how businesses think i cared less about transactions and making tons of money from day one and working myself to death but i cared more about like how do people think um how do people structure thoughts and how do ceos think and i thought consulting would give me that view better uh i think i was right i've never done banking so i don't know but uh, i think i think it worked out and did you um, and then i think consulting gave me three things classic consulting answer but one was like how to think like the the a uh, judicious nature of how people assess slides uh, it's kind of annoying and sometimes pointless when you're making appendix slide but the way you structure thoughts i think is really uh, interesting and and powerpoints taught me to do that um the second was uh learning that everyone that's really smart and i respect is still human seeing really smart people make mistakes and and ceos and c suite not know what to do even though you know i really respected them i think being and then being able to given the chance to speak in a boardroom that was really something um cool and gaining some confidence in that and then the third i realized i was really bad at politics um i was just really really bad at at uh being promoted very quickly in consulting because <laughs> i'm just really bad at politics <laughs> what well, only took you 2 years it says on your linkedin not too bad yeah it was it was fun 2 years is about the right time i think for consulting for me and then when when what was the process decision making process like when you decided to leave consulting and did you feel like you had those skill sets you wanted to then become the entrepreneur you wanted to be uh not at all i think uh, uh there's a pretty common path from consulting into an mba so i wanted to get to the valley and uh again being the risk minimization person that i am um an mba in the valley was a very different route than getting a job i had consulting friends who tried to apply to the valley straight and they just couldn't get interesting jobs because who wants a consultant we can't do anything useful so it makes sense so no one my friends didn't get very cool jobs who went straight to the valley um i didn't realize this at the time but after going to berkeley i realized that when you're a student which you guys are doing very well and you spoke about this before we started you get to take advantage of the student card and turns out like you know in silicon valley the number one school that uh, that people come from for the valley is berkeley so the network is humongous if you start with i'm a berkeley student um and given the way i look i look about 16 so everyone thinks i'm undergrad computer science so it's worked out really well and people want to talk to me because they want to hire me assuming i i do computer science <laughs> and so after you did your mba you obviously went through y combinator and just to preface we sort of mentioned this before but for people in the startup industry y combinator is sort of like the pinnacle mm -hmm. um it's the best accelerator in the world you you have amazing entrepreneurs like paul graham and justin kahn that are there to help people they help fund other people could you just tell us a bit about the experience of y combinator what was it like sort of how did they help you um and what were what did you sort of gain from that experience i'll answer this in two parts first is like yc proper which is what most people know about there's a new program which is public now i think they'll be quite at time but yc growth which is for the kind of growth stage companies two very different experiences 
uh, for me. YC proper, what everyone knows. I was actually in Asia, so I missed out on a lot of the dinners. And the dinners is, I think, what most people talk about or, or uh, remember. But I think I only went to three or something. Um, so my experience was a little bit different from others. And I actually think turned into a positive. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak to how YC helped three ways. One is the pressure cooker. We came into YC as probably the worst decision YC had ever made. We, we didn't know what we were doing for sure. Everyone else seemed to know what they were doing. I compared myself to the other Aussies or Anzacs. There was a, there was a drone delivery company, uh, Kiwis. I think they were the first drone delivery company, commercial drone delivery company in the world. And they signed, my memory is they signed something with NASA. I was like, dang, that's pretty cool. Um, and then there's another Australian company who made like really boring thing, but makes tons of money, like compliance software for government. So every government department has to do oh and s and, and uh, harassment training and all that. So they made online versions of that. And they were growing their profits 20% every month. And we were trying to make an app, give it away for free, and we couldn't get anyone to use us. So first you cook up comparing to everyone else, and you kind of have to choose like, you know, everyone around you is doing really well. Do you cry? Do you work harder? You do a bit of both and yeah, that pressure cook is good. That's one. Second is advice that um, billion dollar founders can give. Uh, I think there's a lot of people willing to give advice in the startup world. Most of it is from people that have never operated before or never been a founder at least. And then never been a founder that succeeded or even a founder that's failed. So uh, it, it, I think YC is very unique in that we had Jeff Ralston who made Yahoo, but is Yahoo Mail, like OG Silicon Valley. We had Jessica Livingston, one of the founders of YC, and then Justin Khan who made a billion dollar company. So it was kind of a very different quality of, of advice. And by that, I mean, we'd ask a question and Justin would be able to say, hey, when I face my situation in this company, this is what we did. In company B, this is what we did. And at Twitch, this is what we did. It may or may not be relevant to you, but here's how it worked out for us. You guys pick. And Justin Khan gave us really important advice um, about halfway through on how to pivot and that kind of changed the trajectory of our lives. So I'm thankful and grateful for that. Now I doubt anyone else who hasn't been through startups can give quality advice like that. That's number two. Number three is demo day where they've constructed this perfect situation where you were the hottest company for a day. Um, I, we wouldn't be able to raise for Indonesia, which no one knew about in 2015. Um, if it wasn't for YC putting a stamp on us. So those are three things for kind of YC proper. Um, for kind of YC growth, very different experience. I actually went to that one, so I wasn't far away. It's 12 weeks. Uh, they bring in like a CEO of some mega company uh, in terms of like growth and startup world. And then there's only 18 of us and we just have the topic and we get to ask questions. So much more intimate group. And actually the problems that you face kind of series B onwards are more similar between companies than when you're at the very beginning. At the very beginning, we're all trying to find product market fit. Series B onwards, you're trying to talk about scale, hiring, executives, levels, compensation, much more similar questions. So that one was also really insightful. Um, and we took, I took notes like crazy and we implemented a whole bunch of things from that. So really useful experience as well. Yeah, sounds like an amazing experience. Um, and it's interesting to hear your sort of initial struggles of not really understanding what your product was. Um, but as you talked about on the Quest podcast, when you eventually found product market fit, um, it went off really quickly. I think it was you got 16,000 users um, on your app within something like six weeks, um, and it just really took off. So I'd love to ask you, how did you start to distribute your product once you found product market fit? What were those sort of marketing techniques which enabled you to reach so many people so quickly? Yeah, it's it's pretty easy actually. It's the same formula that Uber uses or PayPal used in the past. PayPal, one of the PayPal folk wrote a book called The PayPal Wars. And uh, in there, he, he kind of lays out exactly what PayPal did. Um, I literally copied and pasted maybe with a bit more creativity than that, but copied and pasted the formula. So on one day we'd be like, all right, guys, we're on page 14 and next week we'll be on page 15, but we would follow what they said. And it's actually pretty simple. You give away money for free. And I think like lots of startups pretend that they do something more complicated, but most start consumer startups that grow really quickly, or at least FinTech give away money for free. Um, and you can do that in smart ways and, and silly ways, of course, but uh, like Venmo did it, PayPal spent 200 million in two years or something. Uh, and you can drive uh, really nice viral effects by getting people to refer their friends and incentivizing the behaviors with the hope being that when you incentivize it enough, you create enough uh, kind of 
behavioral change that will keep using your application. So it's worked. It's worked in lots of situations, which is why people do it. Um, but it's definitely not rocket science. Very different from B2B where you have to have kind of positive unit economics from day one. And it's a much more like sales and account management game. Uh, consumer was dump money. So if we just try and sort of break down that process a little bit, it sounds like you create like a really good product initially, then you create a sort of added layer, which is the incentive giving money. And then you sort of keep on doing that until it becomes really viral. And eventually you can start to monetize your consumers after a while. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's like, that's the playbook that so many consumer startups have done. And, and, and I, I think past. for... I think for our Aussie audience, probably a similar story is um, Beam It, how yeah. initially you'd have that $5 fee. And I think they did create stickiness and a lot of people use that for splitting bills or payments now. Um, Moses, a question that I think we're both itching to ask is the differences between Australia and Silicon Valley. Now you seem to allude to the fact that it's a lot easier to make it at Silicon Valley and you're surrounded by these amazing minds and amazing people. But I think recently in Australia, we've seen a movement towards people thinking, okay, we may be able to actually make it in Australia. We have the big VCs like Blackbird and Airtree becoming more prominent. And there is a sense of there being more of an entrepreneurial ecosystem now than there was a few years ago. Um, I'm going to ask this in a selfish way, but if you were like an ambitious young early 20s some person, would you stay in Australia or would you move to the Valley? I'll caveat this is I'm I'm not in Australia right now and I have no idea. I know the Etri guys because I worked with them at BCG and and one was at Excel, uh, one of our investors. So um, I I believe that things are pretty different based on what I'm hearing now than before. But given the same situation, just given my experience, I'd have to say still Silicon Valley. The main reason being uh, there's a network effect that comes from having the most capital in the world. Again, I'm not sure about China's latest stats, but let's say for us as Aussies, um, most capital in the world also with some of the highest talent in the world. And the you have this critical mass of ideas flowing all the time with the talent to make it happen. And I think that's really rare. Um, and that's a big part of why I think, and this has been argued in books and the such, Silicon Valley has done so well. So when you have the network effect, kind of like YC, yeah, there's probably, there's, there's going to be a, a YCS thing in Australia for sure, too, if it doesn't exist already. But YC attracts the best investors and the best startups, and that's a real network effect. And the Valley has that location-wise. Um, and maybe it's not for everyone. These, all these lessons can, are now open sourced, and YC's startup school is all on YouTube. Um, but for me at the time, really putting on the right paradigms on my head was was something I learned when I got here. Um, the ex easiest example I have is like the, you know, having access to these billionaire, well, bill founders who made billion dollar companies. And uh, I have two that made billion dollar companies and then VCs who I respect and mentored me who've um, invested in some of the biggest names in tech in OG and, and now too, um, just totally changed my mind. I'll give a quick example, Rob Chandra, who was Forbes Midas list five times, which just means he, Midas list is like the most successful VCs who's on that list uh, five times over his career. Um, also one of the most genuine, nice guys. But I went to him, uh, he was kind of an adjunct professor at Berkeley. And I went to him with my ideas in an office hours. Uh, and I said, here's my ideas, I got 10 of them. And he stopped me five minutes. This is the way I remember it. He's much nicer than this, but this is the way I remember it. He said, Moses, don't talk to me anymore. I was like, oh, dang, you know, I've screwed up. Um, don't talk to me anymore unless your idea is worth a billion dollars. And at first I was like, oh, shit, you know, I've really screwed up here. Um, but then I walked away and realized, huh, that's kind of cool. He thought that I was going to come in and talk about billion dollar ideas. And no one has ever expected me to turn up with billion dollar ideas. Not my mom, not my dad, not BCG, not my wife, not anyone, not me. Um, and so he was the one, he was the first person that actually believed I'd come with a billion dollar ideas. And that changed everything. Cause I was like, oh, maybe I can come up with billion dollar ideas. And that's just one example. And that was two years of, I'd say paradigm shifts whilst I was in Silicon Valley, learning how people think and why people think the way they do, uh, which changed how I think about the world. And you just, it's hard to find that. At least for me, it was hard to find that in 2010 ish in Australia. Maybe now it's different. 
I think that story is like such a good way to epitomize the culture of Silicon Valley and sort of American American general, just having sort of people that believe in you enough uh, that they think you're going to start a billion dollar company. And I think that's something that means Sachin feel previously, we don't have enough of that attitude um, in Australia, but I think it's definitely starting to change. Yeah. I, I think there's always that age old uh, metaphor of tall poppy syndrome in Australia. And I was just thinking about with that, we're sitting at Sydney Uni right now. I don't think any professor would ever ask a student no way. <laughs> for a billion dollar idea. Um, and the difference is, between Australia and Silicon Valley, they've been talked about a lot, but is there anything that you've noticed in particular tactically that's different between the scenes in Australia and Silicon Valley? Like you pointed to the differences in capital and the network effects, but is there anything else that you can think of that's that you think is more advantageous in Silicon Valley? Yeah, I, I think the two most important are the people and, and the money because everything kind of flows from that, lots of implications. I'll, I'll turn it the other way for half a second and say it. Um, I'm, I'm extremely proud to be Australian. Uh, and I think we have attributes that make us really good entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know what I've said about this in other domains, but we are known for being lazy, which I think actually makes us really good entrepreneurs because we don't like to build things that take time and we don't like to have to do things we don't have to do. So I think when, when we apply work ethic to our laziness, we actually come up with something pretty cool. And my favorite example of that for Americans is, I speak about Gallipoli where once we told the British to leave us alone and we were in charge of the retreat, we invented a gun that fired automatically based on water droplets, right? Dropping out of a can. It's kind of very Australian ingenious invention, but it meant that the Turks never attacked us because they thought we were still at our post firing at them. Meanwhile, we were actually retreating and no Australian lives, this is what I remember. I might be wrong. Someone fact checked me. But I think no Australian lives were lost in the retreat. And so I think that's a really cool example where Australian ingenuity actually comes from our laziness or the desire to, to not have to do things. I think that makes for really good entrepreneurs because we're all like software as a service is all about how do we make life, people's lives easier? How do we do more with less? So I'll say that's an Australian attribute, which I think is, is really important. The second I think is like we're not, we don't have kind of big sticks up ourselves, which I think. Is, is useful in the startup world because when you have, when you're too worried about what everyone else thinks about you, I think you trap yourself in trying to come up with the best idea or having to impress someone or put on a face. But when I hang out with the other Aussies in Silicon Valley, we joke about how, how much we fail or how, how much our product sucks. It's like a very different world than hanging out with Americans who always have the face and the facade on. And I think when you're honest with yourself, you can lie to us. I think when you're too American, maybe you lie to yourself too much and you end up with a Theranos or WeWork where you actually believe you're God. <laughs> I, don't, and I think that's a lower risk for Australians who are so used to laughing at ourselves. Or if you try to say you're God, another Australian will bring you right back down to earth. Uh, and so I think that makes a better startups because you're more humble and you actually care about what customers want and you don't get caught up in your own, um, own BS. That's mm. a good way of putting it. Very, very interesting discussion. Um, so I'd like to change the topic a little bit now um, and talk about your company and where you're positioned. So I think a good way to sort of encompass send it is that sort of like the stripe of Southeast Asia, um, enabling digital payments in a rapidly growing area. And I'd love for your opinion on what do you think are the big trends happening now in Southeast Asia, which is really enabling your business for success um, and just sort of talk maybe a little bit about what your company does and how that is latching on to these bigger trends of digitalization and whatnot. Yeah, I think Stripe is a pretty good analogy for an Australian audience. What we do is we help businesses uh, with their payments infrastructure, plus, plus, we do a few other things. Uh, within payments, we help people accept money. Uh, we help people set, pay out money. So payouts, most money that comes into a business leaves a business again, payroll, refunds, um, paying suppliers, whatever the reason. And then the third part is holding money, escrow accounts, custodian accounts, bank accounts as a service, that kind of thing. On top of that payment stack, we then build value added services is what we call it, but other things that are very adjacent to payments um, that help us, data products, name validators, KYC products, know your customer products. Uh, and then also we have a a lending product where we lend to our customers because we can see their cash flows. So that's what we do. Why I, there's a rising tide that raises all ships. I don't think um, we can take credit for everything. I think one thing 
again, this is advice from Rob, but the first thing you get to pick is when the, the world is your oyster, you get to pick what game you play. So making sure you play the right game. And so for me, let's talk about the game and let's talk about what we do within the game. But the game is within Southeast Asia, you have uh, the fourth largest country on earth, um, Australia's neighbor in Indonesia. Um, and then you have in the region, uh, uh, the average age is less than 30. So 50% of the population is under the age of 30. You have mobile phone penetration above 100%. So the average person is more than one phone. Wow. Smartphone penetration, like 80% and growing. Um, internet access everywhere. And they never, they never had laptops or desktop computers. So they're, they're straight to mobile. Um, so you have extremely young. Oh, you also have the, like the most social cities in the world. I think like the most DA used for like Twitter and Facebook and probably Instagram and WhatsApp. So you have a young, massive population with access to technology, but infrastructure that's extremely poor. And so when you notice in other countries, even without those massive populations, you see e-commerce start, then you see infrastructure businesses, then you see FinTech, then you see, you can see the kind of life cycle of what goes through. And so in Southeast Asia, to oh, me, sorry, Moses, I'm going to quickly interrupt you, but if you could quickly dive into more about what the state of um, payments in Indonesia was like and what opportunity you saw um, yeah. aside from the macro. Yeah. So then when we went to Indonesia, we, we looked in and, and we talked to, um, well, we actually, we tried to build this Venmo style thing first, this kind of peer to peer transfers uh, of cash. And we had to integrate with a payments company and there wasn't anyone like Stripe. And we spoke and looked at the APIs of other payments companies and we, it was, none of it was good enough. So we built it ourselves. And so on the pay-ins, for example, you had to speak to the banks individually to be able to get the pay-ins. There was no ability to like integrate with one API and get them all. On the payouts, nothing existed. Uh, so we had to build that machine ourselves. So the state of payments was it's really, really hard to get paid as a digital business. Um, there's no single API for accepting payments. There's no APIs at all for sending money, um, let alone like doing things at scale or the other features you need on top if you're running a, a tech company. And so we had built all this infrastructure ourselves. And I remember one Easter, um, a, a couple of friends and I were having lunch and they said, how do you move money so quickly? How do you get money like across instantly? And uh, they described, oh, we had to build this. This is how we did X, Y, Z. And they said, hey, if, if you can give that to us, we'll pay for you. Now we'll pay for it on Monday. And so that's, that was a pivot weekend over Easter weekend where we pivoted and built an API for dispersing money on Monday. Uh, wow. We lost the customer. It was a pretty bad API. <laughs> um, I, <I'm, laughs> um, but we managed to get other customers and improve our APIs since. So uh, that was the opportunity we saw. We just, there was no payments infrastructure. And so we had to build it. Um, but infrastructure is also, when we think about pivoting, there was a few different options for fintech companies we wanted to pivot into. But we thought the infrastructure play was nice because one, we could actually help the region build things that the region has never seen before. And two, all this macro drives um, infrastructure businesses up. We don't know exactly what's going to win, but if we serve enough players, uh, we'll get a piece of the pie. Hmm. And after talking about that, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the future of payments as well. So we see this sort of rising tide of mobile phone, um, instant payments uh, usage in Indonesia. What's next for that region? Um, and also just for the world, in your opinion, I'm sure we'll sort of start to talk about crypto a bit here. Um, the world, I won't dare to opine because I don't think I know enough. But for at least for our region, I think what I can say is uh, I, I think cash will still play a big part. Uh, when we look at the demographics and how hard it is to change behavior, I think cash is, is, will be here for at least, I don't know, let's call it 10 years. Um, and then I think the e-wallets, we haven't seen, we see some usage, but I don't think we see like organic usage in a big way yet. It's still very incentivized. I mean, you keep giving people money, they'll use whatever you want. They'll download whatever app you want and you give them money. So that's just still the state of kind of e-wallets. Um, but we are seeing businesses go online. So we will see, I think, cash move into digital cash in some form, whether the bank transfer, e-wallets, or um, just straight into the merchant. Uh, I think we will see more digitization. Um, 
maybe that's a that's a boring answer because I think it's obvious. We just cash will move online. It won't be all of it. Will be some of it. Um, and when you've got a trillion dollar economy and the fourth largest country on earth, you know, a lot of there's a big opportunity. And then when you think about the region, uh, there's even more opportunity. So that's what I see for payments. Um, you mentioned crypto. Crypto is a is a fun world in that I think Southeast Asia, each country treats it very differently. And so at least in Indonesia, it's not allowed as a form of, it can't be used as currency, it can't be used as a medium of exchange, it can be used as an asset, kind of like gold. So it means it's restricted in use case. Um, and I think other ever countries in the region treat it differently. Um, so we haven't seen demand for accepting payments via crypto. We can't for Indonesia at all, but I mean, even for other markets, I think when we do, we'll, we'll accept it. Uh, we actually started sending it as a, at a Bitcoin hackathon, an Andreessen Horowitz Bitcoin hackathon between Berkeley and Stanford. And uh, as kind of the underdog Berkeley kids, we were proud to win that. Um, but uh, so there's, there's kind of this old school Bitcoin in our blood in that sense, but uh, we haven't touched it for a long time. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're bullish as a group on crypto and, and my co-founder worked at Ripple for a while. So um, we're bullish that there's something there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this um, decentralization theme is something that we've been hearing over and over again from our guests and people we've talked to. And it's, it's, it's good to hear that you're in a more kind of contemporary payment space right now, but you're open to all the new innovation. Like that's really interesting mm, to more hear. Rational. Um, I think there's one last question that I'm really dying to ask you before we get into our quick fire rounds. And you mentioned before that you're not technical, um, you don't uh, know coding and you didn't study computer science. So how have you dealt with um, building up a company which is really quite technical um, in the sense that you're building API and payment sort of gateways for other companies? Got on technical. So actually like, I wouldn't say I'm a dev, but uh, I built our website um, and taught myself to code, which I think is the minimum, what well, I think should be the minimum for a business person looking to build a tech company. Um, it's helped in lots of ways. It helps to understand uh, why devs think the way they do and or um, just not be like beating around the bush um, and be able to like have conversations with people and understand. So I think we've just had to become technical. Yeah. Um, so I'm probably... I'm definitely not a dev, but I can have some conversations. I don't know if our devs would agree with that, but uh, <laughs> um, in, enough to have done something myself so that I learn how, how it works a little bit. And then, um, yeah, we sell this stuff day in, day out. We look at architecture diagrams all day. So um, we're, we're now we're used to it. Yeah. And did you learn to code um, as you started thinking about the idea of Send It? Or was this before, like, potentially while you're doing your MBA? Um, it was while I was doing the, well, we were, it was kind of at the same time because we were launching Send It whilst I was at school and the other two co-founders didn't like the front end, they want the back end. So someone had to make the website and I like PowerPoint slides and pretty things. So I figured, Hey, I'll just, I'll just whip this up. Um, and it's not rocket science, so anything can be learned. So I just decided why not get on it? Um, and so it took a couple of weeks, but, uh, we got there, we built something. Awesome. And Moses, um, love to ask what's next for you. So um, send it's valued at at least a hundred million dollars. Now um, you're rapidly moving around Indonesia. What's next and what does kind of success look like for you in the next 10 to 20 years of your career? 10 to 20 years. That's a longer, uh, longer time frame than I normally get given 10 to 20 years. Here's what I see. One, I think of us as a digital infrastructure business. When you look at, when you look at developed economies around the world, you see that there's lots of digital infrastructure that must exist. Things like cloud, email, CRM, uh, payments, uh, credit risk, data, lots of things. Some infrastructure, global players win. Gmail, I don't see why a local player will win Gmail or cloud, but some things local players will win. Payments, tax, invoice, AARAP, um, credit risk. So. What I see for Southeast Asia is that we need to build all this digital infrastructure. It must exist for our economies to go from where we are now to full, fully digital and service economies. And right now, no one cares about that space. Everyone cares about consumer. It's a sexy stuff. It's what hits newspapers. What we do doesn't hit newspapers at all. It's really boring. Most people are like, I don't get it. What does payments mean? And that's in my mind, a good thing. The, the less people care about our space, the better. 
Um, but that's where I see the opportunity is that in all this, all the next startups of tomorrow, all the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, they need to build on top of infrastructure. So what AWS did for compute, we want to do for all the other back office payments, access to money, lending, uh, credit risk, data products, KYC, invoicing, all these things. That's what we want to do. So that's 20 years. I think there's, you know, in, in each of these verticals in the US, you have I don't know, 10, 15 billion dollar companies um, that maybe none of us have heard the name of. I want to do the same thing for, for Southeast Asia, except that in Asia, no one knows and no one cares. So maybe we can be like five or six of these billion dollar companies by ourselves. So that's, that's on the business. That's one measure of success. Um, the second one is more a personal mission, which is just, I, I really enjoy getting people to uh, foster up the path, if you will, and instead of having to learn what I had to learn the hard way. And so I, in general, we talk about this thing called the Senate Mafia. It's, it's taken straight from the PayPal Mafia. But the idea that the, the early employees at PayPal all started these like billion dollar businesses, Palantir, SpaceX, Tesla, Affirm, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have this heart that we bring up a cadre of a generation of people who care about doing good um, and building companies that change our world um, and are really successful at doing it. Um, the, yeah, I think, I just think that'd be a cool thing to do. And so my current metric of that is that two Senate alums have gotten into YC. So five years ago, there was zero, um, you know, Indonesian companies in YC. Uh, we were one of the first five Southeast Asian companies into YC. And now we've had two Senate alums and both in different countries get into YC. So that's the beginning of that. But, uh, but to hear the feedback from people change from like, oh, I didn't know how to build a, you know, nine figure size company or 10 figure size company to now being at send it and realizing how to do it. It goes from us to, it goes from them to me. I can do it. Now I know how to do it. I think that's really cool to watch. So I know I really, that's the second success metric for me. We can build this generation of people who kind of want to, um, I can't, this is a podcast. I can't say the word I exactly want to say, but kind of screw up the world for good uh, is what I want to, I want, I want to get to. And I think our generation is a lot more altruistic and well, at least we pretend to be more altruistic than, than those in the past. I think we can rewrite the rules. That's awesome. And congrats to those people from getting into YC. You're creating quite the legacy there. It's really cool. Um, and so for the next part, uh, this is where we ask the quick fire questions. So basically yeah. we ask sort of four or five questions, um, 30 seconds each, um, just about some of the things that have influenced you before. Um, are you good to go? Sure, let's try. Cool. What's one of your favorite books and why? High Growth Handbook by Elad Gill. Uh, it is for companies who are in the growth stage. I mentioned YC Growth earlier and how much they taught us. High Growth Handbook is YC growth already codified. So I thought that this was all private information that wasn't in the public domain. I found this book uh, by Stripe Publishing and uh, it blew my mind. So this is what I make uh, all the managers that report to me read. I can definitely recommend that book. It's awesome. What's one of your favorite podcasts and why? Oh, um, this is maybe too cliche an answer, but Masters of Scale by Reid Hoffman. Um, it's, it's, to get that answer a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, really good podcast, though. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great podcast. I think there's really there's probably a few episodes that I've listened to over and over again, and in different times taken away different things. Um, so, yeah. Next question: Who's an inspirational figure to you that you've never met before? I'll say Martin Luther King. Um, early on in life, I did public speaking as a nerdy I know, competitive thing and I quoted him a lot I found him an amazing orator definitely not like the same style I would have um, and maybe a cliche answer too but I just think his his kind of rhyme and rhythm and the way he speaks and his ability to motivate and the character in which he conducted himself um, is something I I really admire I just I'm, I'm recency biased here because I just bought like the little golden book version of Martin Luther King for my for my son and was reading that to him today Awesome. Last question. What's one of your favorite hobbies outside of work? And it can't, and, and and it it can't, can't be, be reading. And it can't be killing cockroaches. I was going to say. <laughs> uh, play, I, I really enjoy manual labor. Um, I, find that, <laughs> I, try to, 
if I try to relax and just sit on the beach, I think about work. So the only way to like truly relax is like to get a workout by like sweating and then learning a new skill. And uh, I have this, yeah, I have this goal to not just be like this city kid who can't do anything. So during COVID, uh, this garage I'm sitting in used to just be wood um, and siding. And it's now a finished garage. So I put in insulation, the electricity, the HVAC, the roof, the ceiling. Um, I bought a kind of broken up car and took it apart down to bare metal on the inside and put it back together again with junkyard parts just for fun. Um, so I don't know, it was things to kind of teach myself to be handy and not useless and just look at screens all day. <laughs> And then now I'm like doing gardening like an old person because um, I want to learn to like how hard is it to make food and, and what does it actually look like? So things that involve like manual labor. Yeah. You sound like a very curious person. But when you first said that, I imagined you on a construction site. Yeah, I imagined like you as a tradie. <laughs> my first, one of my first jobs in Canberra was on a vineyard. Um, so uh, remember doing like burnouts and out very bad cars in Canberra in vineyards and then you did a burnout uh, on a vineyard? <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, mate's farm and it's just like dirt and we just like paddock bash our cars around. Um, yeah, so different life, I think, in Canberra. <laughs> um, Moses, I'd love to finish this podcast off by asking kind of our flagship question. So as I mentioned before, we have this audience of kind of 18 to 25 year old, ambitious um, early 20 somethings. Now, if you could um, leave them all with a bit of advice from your amazingly successful career, what would that be? I have this deck called Silicon Valley Frameworks that I do kind of every six months at Send It to just explain to people what changed in my brain and, and why it was so helpful and actionable. I'll take something. Uh, if I can only pick one, there's a formula for success that is a mix of Rob Chandra and Justin Khan put together that I really like. Success is a function of luck, work ethic, and smarts. Um, and I like this framework because it's really actionable. So let me break it down. Um, luck is first in the function because I think it's really important. By the probably the fact that you're listening to this, uh, we probably have a lot of luck in our lives. The families that we we're born into, the countries that we we're born into, the education we can have, the food on our table. So we don't have to worry about the basic things. But luck is also really important in startups. And I think uh, a lot of what people don't attribute their life to is because of confirmation bias, not luck. But I think it's really important. I so happen to be born at the right time so that I can build something in Indonesia when, when there's no payments that exist. There's a lot of luck involved. Um, but you can improve your luck by working hard. Uh, and I like, I don't know who told me this, but advice I once got was, the work ethic increases your opportunities at luck. So that's luck. The second part is, is work ethic. This is the part which I think we can control the most. Actually, let me do smarts first. Smarts is we all have some asymptote of smarts. So we can improve smarts in some way, working harder, studying, learning, trying, practicing. But I love soccer. No matter how hard I work, I'll never be like Cristiano Ronaldo. So I have some asymptote in my smarts in that respect. And so there's an asymptote for all of us, depending on what life choices we make and what we want to pursue as careers and such. But there's some asymptote that we have. So that's partly my control, but not 100% of my control. So then work ethic, which is a thing that I think is 100% of my control. I fully control my ability to work hard or dedicate time towards something. And work ethic has this conflating impact on the other two. The harder I work, the more luck I get. The harder I work, the smarter I get up to some asymptote. But what this framework teaches me then is what I need to do most is try, try the best that I can. And then also not measure myself on the outcome, but measure myself on whether I tried the best that I can. Because I think there's people much smarter than me who've tried startups. I, one of the people I respect the most, a good friend, um, has started something, hasn't worked out well, had all the right intentions. He's smarter than me, worked just as hard as me, hasn't worked out. I don't think of him anything less, so I don't think I'm any more special or smarter. He should also be on this podcast, but humans, you know, rely on success bias or confirmation bias. So, um, yeah, I think being able to then, uh, the framework helps with emphasizing work ethic, being thankful for, for the luck you get, and then also being grateful and an ability to kind of be happy with uh, whatever kind of result you get if the inputs were right. And I think that makes for kind of 
people have described it as stoic, but maybe stoic and happy version of startup life versus always looking at someone who's bigger and better and then uh, wishing you're someone else. Wow. I think out of like the hundreds of podcasts I've heard from entrepreneurs, that's probably one of the best bits of practical advice that actually feeds humility in with, as you said, stoicism, gratitude, but also that you need to work hard. Like I think mm. that's, that's an awesome framework. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, that brings us to the end. Thank you very much, Moses. I'm sure you're going to inspire the next generation of um, Australians that move to Silicon Valley. If we have a shortage of talent, we're going to blame it on you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> over here but thank you for the episode thank you very much moses yeah that bit at the end that was really inspiring and great advice thanks guys for having me thanks mate